Hello, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi. Today, what we're doing is a debate on the resurrection of Jesus. What was required for Christianity what, to begin was a physical uh, resurrection required. We've got some feedback, actually. Is uh, is it, uh, are, are both of you using headphones? Sorry, we didn't have this before the, the show started, but it sounds like it actually might have cleared up. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get rolling again, and hopefully we don't have any more... Uh, feedback. But uh, yeah, so we're doing a debate today, and this is a sort of semi-formal, semi-informal debate. So we're going to do 10-minute openings followed by moderated dialogue, and we're going to try to keep it to around 90 minutes for the debate portion and then turn it over to Q&A for... Is that a dog in the background? It's my puppy. Pa yep. Oh my goodness. So I, have a, I have a soft spot for dogs. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, yeah, sorry. No. What's her name? Bella. Yeah. Bella. Hmm. Um, well, yeah, so we're, we're going to try to stick to around 90 minutes of dialogue and then we're going to switch to Q&A with the audience. We'll see how that goes. I mean, typically with these debates and stuff, usually around the time when it's time to switch to Q&A is like when the most interesting conversation is happening. So we'll play it by ear. We'll see what we can do. But uh, both guests today, Apologia and uh, or, or Paul, we'll just call him Paul today. And, uh, and, and Jonathan, I've got both of their information. If you'd like to learn more about either of the guests today debating, then you can learn more about them in the description of the video. We're not going to do long winded introductions for either of these guys. We're just going to jump directly into the content, the stuff that you guys are here for. So the way that we've got it formatted, Jonathan is going to go first. He's got 10 minutes to give an opening statement. He's got slides and then Paul's going to go second again, 10 minutes for him. And he's got slides accompanying his presentation as well. And then after that, as I say, we're going to get into to uh, dialogue and just have a, a good, healthy, productive, hopefully productive chat today on the resurrection of Jesus. So we'll see where things go. Um, and usually I'll just say this and then I'll turn it over. I try to stay out of the conversation when I host debates like this as much as possible. So I'll, I'll only hopefully introduce, uh, uh, interrupt or, or come in if, if I need to help move the conversation along. But the goal for me is to stay out as much as possible, let these guys chat it out. So uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Jonathan. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and uh, and start presenting and then I'll, I'll keep a timer and then we'll move over to Paul and then we'll, we'll do some dialogue. So whenever you're ready. Well, thanks so much. Great to be here. Uh, thanks, Paul, for agreeing to participate in this dialogue. I'm just going to write, um, get right in. Uh, we're talking about the case for the resurrection and I'm going to be, be presenting uh, a Pateley style approach or sometimes called the maximal data case for the resurrection. So basically, this is the argument in a nutshell. We possess a testimony from apostolic eyewitnesses that Jesus rose physically from the dead and appeared to them alive. We'll talk about some of the evidence for that. Um, that being the case, then we are faced with a trilemma. Basically, what explains or gives an adequate account of the apostolic testimony that Jesus was raised from the dead? Is it that they're honestly mistaken, that they lied about it, or is it Jesus rose from the dead, or indeed, perhaps a combination thereof? Now, um, I'm going to argue that the content of the apostolic testimony makes it quite unlikely that they were deceived. And moreover, the circumstances of the apostolic testimony makes it quite unlikely that they were deceivers. And therefore, the most probable, in my judgment, explanation is that the content of their testimony is true. So let's begin with this first contention, that we possess testimony from apostolic eyewitnesses that Jesus rose physically from the dead and appeared to them alive. And so key to making this argument will be the case that the Gospels and Acts actually reflect the, um, the, the unembellished testimony of those who were purportedly eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Uh, and that being the case, that gets us to a place where we can bring out the trilemma. So one category of evidence for the uh, reliability of the Gospels and their grounding in eyewitness testimony is a category of evidence known as undesigned coincidences, where basically you have sometimes two works by different authors intersecting in a way that would be unlikely if one of them were copied from the other or both were copied copied from a common source. So for, for example, one book you mentioned in passing a detail that answers some question raised by the other, the two records fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So an example of this is if we turn over to John John's account in chapter 13, this is the account of the last supper that Jesus has with the disciples before his death. And it says that in verse four and five, Jesus laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, of course, you might wonder, why does Jesus decide to wash the disciples' feet on this particular occasion? Well, we turn over to Luke's account in chapter 22 and verse 24, which describes the same occasion. But Luke, notice, does not mention the foot washing, but does mention in verse 24 that a dispute arose among the disciples as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And so Luke, only Luke mentions that dispute 
that explains why Jesus gave them the object lesson in servanthood of washing the disciples' feet. Um, so J John only contains the foot washing episode and Luke only contains the occasion that gave rise to it. And so you've got this hand and glove fit that I think is best explained on the hypothesis of historicity. Another example in John's account in chapter 12, um, it, um, it says um, six days before Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, and that's the, the night before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Although all four gospels mention the triumphal entry, John's gospel is the only one that tells us that Jesus arrived in Bethany the night before, and then in the morning he, set, he, he entered Jerusalem, and that Jesus approached to Bethany was six days before Passover. Now, um, in verse 12, it has, tells the next day he enters Jerusalem. Now, if we go over to Mark's account in chapter 11, Mark gives us a, a different account. He telescopes or condenses a narrative relative to John. He doesn't mention it, what, it was the night before that he entered Bethany and it wasn't until the morning that he enters Jerusalem. But it tells us that when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, the men of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately as you enter, you'll find a colt tied and so forth. Now, um, I, I'm going to propose that we can actually find each of those days in Mark's gospel, even though Mark doesn't give us that same time stamp that we find in John about the six days and the five days before Passover. So in, in verse 11, it mentions that he entered Jerusalem, went to the temple when he looked around to everything. As it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. So this would therefore be the evening, supposing John to be correct, five days before Passover. Um, verse 12 says, in the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. This would be the morning, supposing John is correct four days before Passover. When evening came, they went out of the city. That would be the evening, four days before Passover. Uh, verse 20, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the victory withered away to his roots. That would be the morning, three days before Passover. And then you have various episodes that happened that day. And then you get to the Olivet Discourse in chapter 13, where Jesus talks to his disciples concerning the signs of the end of the age on the Mount of Olives, midway between Jerusalem, where he's been all day, and Bethany, where his accommodation is for the night. And so we can assume reasonably that he's on his way back from his accommodation, uh, uh, from Jerusalem to his accommodation in Bethany. And this is the evening, three days before Passover. And then you turn over to chapter, two, uh, to chapter 14, and it says it was now two days before the Passover. So it synchronizes exactly as you would expect, given the chronology of John, and does so in such a casual and undeliberate way that actually supports the historicity of the account in this very specific um, detail. Um, another category of evidence is unexplained allusions. So this is an example um, from Mark 15, 21, where Jesus is going towards his crucifixion site, and it mentions that the Romans compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Now, who are Alexander and Rufus? They're just name-dropped, like we're supposed to know who they are. Um, but th this name-dropping of those otherwise unknown characters who are not mentioned anywhere else in the Gospels, playing a further role in the story, I think is a mark of verisimilitude. Um, presumably, they were known to the original audience, but we don't know who they are today. Um, in John 7, another example, and the, um, this is speaking about the Feast of Tabernacles. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. There's a problem, though. Where is this verse in the Hebrew Bible? Uh, we don't know. Um, in fact, uh, Leon Morris comments, he says, one problem is the notorious difficulty of knowing what passage of the Old Testament Jesus had in mind. But the very fact that the difficulty can arise is, of course, evidence for the genuineness of the passage. It is intelligible that Jesus cited scripture in an, in an unusual fashion. It's not intelligible that someone who was manufacturing the incident would affirm that Jesus ascribed certain words of scripture, but do it so badly that no one has been able to find the passage. Jesus presumably uh, was giving uh, an interpretation of some set of Old Testament scriptures, but this isn't the way you would expect a, a fabricator to do it. Um, another category of evidence is artless similarities, which basically refer to the casual consistency with which a character is portrayed across different episodes involving the character and across the four Gospels. So an example of this is in John 7, we read that Jesus answered them, this is after he's been challenged to, about healing someone on the Sabbath day. I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? And so we can see from the context that Jesus had, is making reference to the healing of the paralytic that... Um, evoked the beginning of persecution against him by the Jewish authorities. Um, and the reason for that is that it took place on the Sabbath. Um, and in Luke 13, this is a different episode, not, a, not the parallel. We read, again, Jesus is challenged on a different occasion for healing someone on the Sabbath, this time a woman that's bent over and can't stand upright. And the Lord answered him, 
You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And not not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. So notice the similarity between those two uh, pericopes. You've got an accusation of hypocrisy concerning Sabbath practice coupled with a pun. So in John, the pun concerns circumcision, cutting off part of a man on the Sabbath versus Jesus making a man whole on the Sabbath. Whereas in Luke, the pun compares untying an animal on the Sabbath versus Jesus loosing the woman who has been banned for 18 years. And so you can see the, the, the parallel in the way that Jesus speaks. This is, these uh, come from, from uh, the one in the same mind. A related example is in Matthew 23, where Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. So he's basically, um, um, he's saying that leaders are, are more concerned about nitpicky matters of their interpretation of the law of Moses, which leads them to weigh out lightweight herbs, than about far heavier matters such as justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And so he's exposing hypocrisy and their misplaced priorities. Um, uh, um, concerning the, the observation of the law. And he does so consistently using these witty word parallels, untying an animal versus, unti versus untying a person, circumcising versus making whole, light versus heavy. But that's, uh, that, again, seems to come from one and the same mind. And so what's the significance of this evidence then? Well, an avalanche of varied cumulative evidence, I would argue, and this is just the pinnacle of the iceberg, demonstrate that, that the Gospels and Acts are based on the testimony of eyewitnesses, and they're, sus they're sus substantially trustworthy. And so then we ask, okay, so what's the best explanation for the claims in the Gospels concerning the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters? And I would suggest that the content of the apostolic testimony makes it quite unlikely that they were deceived. We, um, we see that they're, they're, public, they're public. Jesus appears to multiple people at once, uh, involves group conversations and so forth. They are multi-sensory. Uh, they involve not just sight, but hearing, conversation, touch, etc. They are extended across a 40-day time period. So it's not just simply a confusing episode. It's a sort of testimony about which it's quite difficult to be honestly mistaken. Moreover, the circumstances of the apostolic testimony makes it enormously unlikely that they were deceivers. Uh, we find that there's a context of persecution whereby the early apostles are willing to volunteer entirely undergo and endure sufferings and imprisonments and dangers on the account of their testimony of the resurrection. Paley summarizes it thusly. He says, there is satisfactory evidence that many professing to be original witnesses of the Christian miracles, past their lives and labors, dangers and sufferings, voluntarily undergone an attestation of the accounts which they delivered and solely in consequence of their belief on those, in those accounts and that they also submitted from the same motives to new rules of conduct. Um, and so in conclusion, um, I've argued that the, uh, the Gospels are, are composed by individuals who are close up to the facts, well-informed, and the habit of being truthful, and that the Gospels are grounded in eyewitness testimony, that the content of the apostolic testimony makes it enormously unlikely they were deceived, the circumstances of the apostolic testimony makes it unlikely they were deceivers, and so therefore I contend that the most probable explanation is that the content of their testimony is true. Thank you for your attention. Wow, that was very close to, uh, to 10 minutes. It went about 10 seconds over, so we'll let Paul have those uh, additional 10 seconds as well, if you'd like to take them. Now, uh, I did want to mention, though, that I asked both of these guys to sort of limit their opening statements to 10 minutes because I think uh, just the fact that our, our tension spans are, are so short these days that I asked them to shorten what they would normally present, say, on their own channels. So if you'd like to learn more about what they argue elsewhere, then please go visit their channels that I've got linked in the description of this video if you'd like to see more of their work. Uh, but this is, expect what you're seeing today as a kind of summary of their views. So we're not getting into every single detail, as uh, as Jonathan just said. is like, this is just the tip of the iceberg and same for Paul when he presents. So just wanted to encourage you to, to go check out their work elsewhere. So, Paul, when you're ready, go ahead and take it away. I'll switch over to your presentation right. now. Well, in 2015, after many decades of being a devout believer, serving, serving vigorously in ministry, and uh, raising God-fearing children, I began to deconstruct, to deconvert. A mentor of mine, uh, who happened to be my very first Bible quizzing coach, he was home on furlough from his missionary work in Japan, and he heard that I was faltering. He heard that I was struggling and he took me out for coffee specifically to challenge me with one thought. What is the single fact about the history of Christianity that no one can deny? And obviously that is that Christianity exists. Forget the Bible, forget everything else he told me. Figure out how Christianity came to be and you'll figure out if it's true. That made great sense to me as a deconstructing uh, person. I took that to heart and I actually made that my mission. Unfortunately, in the end, I came to a radically different conclusion than my mentor expected me to.
All right. Um, does the existence of Christianity require an actual, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus? Is it an absolute, unwavering, unquestionable prerequisite in the same way that oxygen require, fire requires oxygen to burn or that an animal requires the same to live? This is the central tenet of Christianity, but does Christianity need it to be explained? Well, the obvious surface level observation is that something isn't true just because millions of people believe it. The mere existence of Islam doesn't convince Christians that the prophet Muhammad met the angel Gabriel in a cave, or the existence of Mormonism alone doesn't convince a Christian that uh, an angel gave Joseph, Camp, Joseph Smith some, uh, some golden plates, for example. Um, this should be obvious to all, but if you want to say that Christianity is some kind of exception to this, that would be special pleading. But that's surface level and not the kind of thing I expect Jonathan to talk about, and he didn't. Now, vast as it may be, Christianity's impact on Western and global culture was ultimately made by individuals who couldn't personally verify that their, what they believe was actually true. Accurate belief in a resurrection and sincerely mistaken belief in a resurrection hold are motivationally identical and indistinguishable from any tool of inquiry. Let me say that again. Accurate belief in a resurrection and sincerely mistaken belief in a resurrection are motivationally identical. So for our question, the last 1800 years or so inform us of nothing. Although virtually everything about them is open to interpretation and debate, as I'm sure we're gonna have demonstrated today, one cannot deny the existence of the documents that Christians refer to collectively as the New Testament. Now, our stronger, strongest point of agreement today will probably be to accept that at least seven of these documents were actually written authentic letters by the Apostle Paul. Now, among those was his first letter to the church in Corinth. And in that 15th chapter of that said letter, Paul counts himself among the believers who saw Jesus after he died. That said, it's my understanding that Jonathan and I both agree that this passage alone is insufficient to be dogmatic about the nature of those appearances and whether they necessarily reflect physical bodily interactions. But from those undisputed letters, it's also undeniable that some form of Christianity predated Paul's conversion, right? Paul had to persecute someone, there were Christians around. And these earliest Christians didn't become Christians because of the Gospels. They, because the first Gospel, the Gospel of Mark, wouldn't be written for decades after this. So no, these first converts believed because they were told stories that they found compelling. But every religion that begins to exist must have a cause. Whether that resurrection actually happened or not, it's undeniable that at least one person started telling stories that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, that very first story by that very first person fell somewhere on the spectrum of completely reflective of reality to completely in error. At the same time, the teller was somewhere on the spectrum of completely sincere down to completely disingenuous. For Jonathan to demonstrate that the bodily resurrection of Jesus is required for, Christian, for Christianity, it's not enough to show that the single point of convergence of the absolute accuracy and absolute sincerity is what happened, or is even probable, or even what's likely. No, Jonathan would need to show that all the other points on this graph are impossible. Because if any other point on this graph is possible, then the bodily resurrection of Jesus is not required to explain Christianity. Now, I see no reason that even full-on dishonest fabrication could be eliminated, but for years, I've been asking apologists if, how they can eliminate a hypothetical of a single individual who is sincerely mistaken about Jesus rising from the dead. I hope that Jonathan can enlighten me today as to how such a scenario lacks explanatory power. Now, what are these so-called Christian martyrs? individuals who died horrible deaths for claiming to have seen resurrected Jesus. Unfortunately, the Christian me who went off on this quest 
was mortified to find that there is no solid evidence for any such person or even the watered down claim of being willing to suffer. Um, I'm looking forward to talk about more of this, but Jonathan mentioned his slide, so I look forward to talking about this more if Jonathan wishes. And what are the Gospels? The four accounts that evangelicals assert are eyewitness testimonies of Jesus' resurrection. Once again, Christian me was devastated to find that the evidence for traditional authorship is built on the flimsiest and meagerest and late church tradition, nothing more. Undeniably, the stories about Jesus were passed around verb verbally for the first few decades. In a form of literary evolution, the phrasing and the details that were most convincing were the ones that earned converts and therefore were reproduced by being told again, perhaps with, with slight embellishments each time for to add verisimilitude or to answer objections that might be raised. This was the oral tradition that predated the Gospels. Now, eventually, the author of Mark wrote some of these stories down. Later on, the authors of Luke and Matthew decided that Mark needed to be improved, so they put out their versions. And many years later, John, the author of John, uh, who was well aware of all the documents that came before him, created his own version. Now, I have found nothing in these four accounts that requires an actual bodily resurrection to have happened to explain the book's existence. In the past and today, Jonathan has leaned into an apologetic called undesigned coincidences, the notion that subtle hints in disparate documents are unintentionally affirming. I confess that I have been dismissive of this particular apologetic in, in the past, if only in part because Christian me, even Christian me, found this to be straining credulity. Far from needing custom ad hoc rationalizations for each one, each example to me is clearly one or more of literary dependence, harmonizing established tradition, which may well even have historical kernels, pure speculation, or even actual coincidence. So, uh, but, to remain today, but to remain today's discussion, I would love to know, and I'm sure we'll get into this a lot, if we add up all the undesigned coincidences and undesigned illusions and all those things, if we add those all together, all the ones in the world, how does that add up to Christianity requiring a resurrection as opposed to being a best example? I'm looking forward to hearing how. So in summary, as far as my evidential journey has taken me, I've found no aspect of church existence, no aspect of church history that requires a resurrection. If you find a resurrection to be plausible or even pl probable or preferred for whatever reason, that's all well and good. But I trust that the intellectually honest among those listening today will come to realize that Jesus rising is not the only narrative that fits all the facts. Thank you. I thought you were going to read that you're... last bit out loud. Because I'm not reading. You used the by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, I was also going to comment on the fact that like your lights and the way that you uh, design your like you clearly have an eye for the aesthetic. Um. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to ingratiate <laughs> myself. I'm I'm the uh, I'm on enemy territory here, so you know had to do what I could. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, now we're gonna what we're gonna do is is turn it over to uh, live, not live. I was gonna say live Q and A, but Q and A comes later. Um, we're gonna do some moderated dialogue. So about say. Uh, to a, a little over an hour of just moderated dialogue between my two guests, Jonathan and Paul. So, um, Jonathan, why don't you go ahead and start share your thoughts, and then we'll let the conversation uh, happen organically. Sure. Um, so, I, I'm I'm wondering about your use of the word uh, "required" uh, and what you mean by uh, "required." I mean, when I put forward my case for the resurrection, I'm arguing that the resurrection is the best explanation of the, of the dead. I'm not arguing that it's logically necessitated by the evidence. Uh, so what, what do you mean when you say required? Well, that's a good question. I, that was actually why I asked for this particularly to be the, you know, the question that we were discussing about, does it does Christianity require a resurrection? Um, because oftentimes I hear apologists put forth that, you know, all the other explanations are, they, they dismiss them as silly or ad hoc or, or whatever, and, and they, they kind of treat every other naturalistic explanation as if 
it's completely just dismiss not just i know i know you might be more subtle but not just that we can dismiss all of those well the resurrection is you know literally the only one that fits a line with all the evidence so they they want to point to different things and say well this rules out spoon theory or this rules out uh disciples stole the body and and you know a lot of those i'm actually okay with what i wanted to hopefully get to today was either to some kind of agreement that there are naturalistic explanations that fit all the evidence or more interesting to me that that would make that would mean i'm correct in my hypothesis but more interesting to me is if, if i'm wrong um what about the evidence it completely dismisses the idea of so for example you know a single individual who is sincerely mistaken is that is that kind of answer that so uh obviously i'm going to agree that there are naturalistic explanations that quote unquote fit all the evidence in the same way that i would agree that there are naturalist that there, there are uh explanations that are consistent with the young earth that fit all the evidence, even though you and I would both agree that young earth creationism is not a plausible um, perspective um, on the natural sciences. Um, but I mean, you, you can make any set of data, you can make, make any explanation fit any set of data if you invoke enough auxiliary hypotheses and so forth. And so the question that we really want to know is what is the best explanation or what explanation fits the evidence best, not whether there's a possible alternative scenario. Okay. So if it just so i'm clear so you're you're on record as saying that there are naturalistic explanations that are rationally plausible no i say that there are that are possible so okay when, uh, when, you, when you use the word required it seems to me that you're using it in a very rigorous deductive sense that uh i mean it's i mean it, it's, it's possible that the universe was created five minutes ago with an appearance of age i just don't think it's a plausible explanation solipsism is possible logically i just don't think it's plausible so so you're you're going to go with me that there are naturalistic explanations that are possible and yet still fit you even if you, you no matter how unlikely they still fit all the data you, you, you're with me that far uh to the extent that you would also agree with me i'm sure that uh, there are explain there, there are young earth scenarios that are that can be made to be consistent with all the evidence it's just um, it doesn't mean that they're possible i'm not sure i've yet to come across a young earth scenario that uh that you know that there isn't some scientific piece of data that they're leaving out and i guess that's you know kind of where i'm hoping for today is where you'll you'll point out to me oh well if you if you really took this into consideration or or if you looked at that um naturalistic explanations of the resurrection you know can't can't work okay well we can we can move on then because i i i i, I it seems to me that you're using the word required in an absolute deductive sense. And that's just not the standard of evidence that we really engage in, in any other field of historical inquiry. I mean, we, we look for the best explanation, the most probable explanation. So let's, so let's, let's go there for, for now. Let's talk about what you think of, you know, of the things that I put forth, which mm -hmm. things make your explanation, um, no, I actually want to go back to what you, you said that you, you weren't, you didn't agree that natural explanations are plausible. So what about, what about a, you know, people who are sincerely mistaken is implausible in your view? Yeah. Um, so I think that that is more plausible if one is taking a minimal facts approach to the resurrection. And we, you know, that we are aligned in our criticisms of the minimal facts uh, approach and the criticism that I have, and I think you also have, is that uh, that if, it's, it, if, we, if we can't say with confidence what the resurrection experiences are supposed to have been like, it's very difficult to say much with confidence about the, the rationality of the apostles' belief in coming to believe that the resurrection is the best interpretation of what they saw, right? Because if you just go with 1 Corinthians 15, uh, there's, a, there's a number of different types of experiences that are compatible with what's described in 1 Corinthians 15. You could have a, a non-speaking Jesus or one that appears very briefly momentarily for, for a matter of moments and disappears, or one that's seen at a great distance or uh, it could even be taken as disconfirmative of the bodily resurrection. If you have like a hovering Jesus that you move your hand towards him, your hand goes right through him and so forth, that would be disconfirmatory evidence of a bodily resurrection. So um, I, I don't think the minimal facts approach is going to cut it when it comes to making a robust argument for the resurrection. But I think that the approach that I take, which is the maximal data approach, uh, is far stronger and far more robust in ruling out and excluding the hypothesis that the apostles were honestly mistaken. 
And that is because, as I said in my opening statement, the sorts of experiences, the types of experiences of which we read in the Gospels and Acts, supposing that they do in fact reflect credible eyewitness testimony, is is the sort that's very difficult to be honestly mistaken about. Um, because, as I said, they, they are multi-sensory in character, involving multiple sensory modes, group conversations, eating with Jesus on more than one occasion, including when he, an occasion when he cooked breakfast for them, is extended across a, a period of 40 days and involves group conversations and so forth. Um, so anything to, to say to that? So, yeah, so I guess for me, uh, you're making a vast leap that I'm not willing to take with you, that the authors of the books uh, were people who were eyewitnesses, or as far as I'm concerned, I don't even think we have evidence that they were connected to eyewitnesses. I know I know you do. But so you've made a bit of a leap there by saying, well, they couldn't, because of multimodal and because of all these things, they couldn't be mistaken. Um, and so for me... I see no reason to rule out that the Gospels are, as I talked about, literary evolution, that these were, that okay. this was the codif codification of stories that were told for decades, and the ones that were best able to convert people to Christianity were the ones that were kept and eventually written down. So would, would you agree with me that supposing the premise to be correct, that the Gospels and Acts actually do reflect the testimony of eyewitnesses and that what we have in the resurrection accounts actually does reflect the unembellished testimony of those who, purport, who are purportedly eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Do you agree with my assessment that that renders the hypothesis of the disciples being honest and mistaken quite unlikely? Um. I guess that depends on who you think wrote them. Um, so supposing, just, for example, that, that John wrote John, for example, so that, there you that, have it. That if, if John wrote, if John wrote John, yes, I would say that it is unlikely that it's whole cloth fabricated. Okay. Um, so, um, so, so that, that would be one argument. We can, we can tease out the details there. And of course, I'm prepared to defend that the Gospels and Acts actually do reflect um, eyewitness testimony. But there's another argument as well, which I would supplement that with, which I also think uh, significantly undermines the hypothesis of the disciples being honestly mistaken. And that is this. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, as you know, describes... Uh, Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, mm -hmm. he's the fulfillment of the first fruits feast. And the idea is so in, in Leviticus 23, the first fruits feast was when um, the um, it would it would um, celebrate that the uh, the first fruits of the harvest, which was a guarantor, that the remainder of the harvest was yet to come. And uh, Christ is supposed to be the, the fulfillment of that imagery because he is the guarantor of the general resurrection, uh, because he was raised from the dead to glory and immortality. That gets the guarantor, if you will, that the general resurrection will also take place in due course. And um, in Leviticus 23, the Feast of First Fruits is supposed to be celebrated on the day following the first Sabbath following the Passover which would make it the Sunday. And of course, according to all four Gospels, Jesus' resurrection takes place on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. In fact, right from very early on, right from as far back as we can trace, and quite unanimously, uh, there doesn't seem to be a competing tradition, the early Christians uh, changed their sacred day from the Sabbath to the Lord's Day. And the explanation for this is consistently given by the church fathers, is that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And you can find that this is assumed, presupposed in Revelation, when John says I was in the spirit of the Lord's Day, it's presupposed in, in Paul, because Paul alludes to gathering a collection together on the on the first day of the week is also in Acts. Um, and so that also, because of the theological import of Christ's resurrection on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, uh, and its correspondence with the Feast of First Fruits, that also, I think, undermines or is evidence against the hypothesis that they were honest and mistaken, because it points to design. And so the question becomes, what's the locus of the design? Is it God or is it the human authors? Well, again, you're, you're, you're jumping to where I can't go with you. And, and like, so for example, like Paul wrote First Corinthians stories have been circulating for decades. You know, if, if Paul was written in the 50s, you know, already for decades, the, the stories were circulating. So, you know, the Sunday tradition was well established at that point. So Paul was, that was just part of what Paul inherited as part of his Christianity. He, Paul can't attest to what day Jesus rose from the dead. I think you would agree to that. But Paul does um, attest. Sorry, go ahead. And, and no, but Paul can't right. attest what day Jesus rose from the dead. Even if Paul had, a, even if Paul had an actual bodily experience with Jesus, uh, you know, his experience didn't have anything to do with that first resurrection. So Paul couldn't be attesting to the, the day. Um, 
And then, you know, in terms of you're talking about whether all the disciples, you know, could could sincerely be mistaken. I'm I always want to know how how many did there need to be for these stories to have spread? And I I think that there really only needs to be one sincere person to be adequate for these stories to eventually spread. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're, you're jumping a little bit far for me on, on, on this whole idea that the apostles couldn't be mistaken. I'm, I'm, first of all, I don't even, I'm, I'm, I'm don't love the word apostle because it sometimes conflates who the gospel authors were. And it sometimes conflates the 12 and it sometimes conflates, you know, uh, James, the brother of Jesus and, and Paul and all those kind of things. Um, I don't know if, if I can even for myself keep ourselves to eyewitnesses or not eyewitnesses and that kind of thing, um, but I don't I don't know that the gospels aren't merely codification of these stories that were told for decades. Do you you agree with me, right? That for the first X number of decades, the Christianity was spread orally, not written down. Correct. Um, I I I do, however, think that the Gospels and Acts are not the the end result of a long chain of oral transmission. I don't think that they've been through many hands. I think that they are written by individuals who are either eyewitnesses themselves or people who are closely associated with eyewitnesses. And that is, uh, sorry, go ahead. Mm. So, what would be the explanatory difference between, for example, you know, you you have a lot of these undesigned coincidences and a lot of these illusions and all these kind of things. What would be the difference that someone like us today would be able to say that, oh, that was a story that had a kernel of historical truth and then, you know, grew versus, versus an actual eyewitness testimony? How could someone today tell the difference between those two scenarios? So it's the sheer number of cases of confirmation, both internal and external confirmation of the Gospels and indeed the Book of Acts that suggests to me strongly that whoever wrote those sources, whoever wrote those documents are close up to the facts, they're well informed, they're in the know um, about what Jesus said and did and know very, very specific details. So I give the example of John knowing uh, the specific day on which Jesus entered Bethany and the day in which he entered Jerusalem, six days and five days before Passover, respectively, and uh, Mark um, knowing um, the the day in, in chapter 14 as well. Um, and so it's uh, that, that level of specificity uh, and, and so many examples of it that we can historically confirm suggests to me that we're dealing here with very, very credible testimony. So may I give a short example of something? May I use 90 seconds of our time to give kind of an example of a, a counter example? Is that cool with you? Go ahead. So uh, what I, some people know that I used to work for George Lucas of Lucasfilm, and so I have a lot of examples from the realm of Star Wars because it's something I, I used to do day to day. So in the film Revenge of the Sith, and I'm sorry for those of you who don't know the film, but that's fine. In the film Revenge of the Sith, in the opening scene, Anakin and Obi-Wan rescue Palpatine, and there's no other Jedi in the room. He's alone in the room. If you read the novelization of Revenge of the Sith, in the room is a Jedi named Shakti. Now, these are apparent contradictions between the novelization and the film. There was a animated series which came out shortly thereafter, Gendy Tartakovsky's Clone Wars series. Now, that same story is retold in that series. Actually, it's not the same story. There's, there's a story that happens around in the same battle. And during that battle, General Grievous comes across Shaq T, grabs her, and ties her up so she's unable to continue. Now, these none of these three stories reference each other. But if you if you add these, if you look at these various details. It actually explains why Shaq T was present for a while in that room in the novel. But when you got to the film, Shaq T wasn't there because General Grievous had gone and tied her up. Now, that sounds to me identical to the kind of things that are presented with undesigned coincidences. From my perspective, when, when these oral traditions were being spread, people may have raised objections and said, well, you know, you know, what what day did that happen? They would have been pressing each other on details. And the fact that these details became part of the oral tradition, because some people would have been asking probing difficult questions. I think a lot of apologists want to, want to assure to me that probing difficult questions were being asked of these eyewitness stories. You know, that, that these various details would be added for verisimilitude, to added to make this story make sense. And of course, it's the stories that survive, the stories that uh, 
are most convincing, those are the ones that hold on. I, I don't see what it is about these undesigned coincidences that are different than that. I know uh, you've responded to me before and I've, you know, people point to synoptic problem. And, and I know we kind of wave our hands as a synoptic problem sometimes with, with these undesigned coincidences. Can you help me out with why someone who's skeptical of these things should opt for your very favorable, assuming that the gospels are true and finding these details versus someone like me who says, look, designed or not, you know, whether the grass was green or not, the people knew kind of what the seasons were. And that just seems like it becomes part of oral tradition and adding details. How can I tell the difference between those situations? Sure, good question. So it's it's a mark of casualness, I think, is a hallmark of verisimilitude. Uh, it's it's the casualness and artlessness. So um, and so to take one example, um, I gave the example in my opening statement uh, concerning the six days before Passover in uh, in John twelve. Um, so in John twelve verses one and two, where it says six days before Passover. Um, so it's, it's, it's the only gospel account that gives us that extraneous, uh, very specific detail. And then John's also the only gospel account that tells us that the arrival in, in Jerusalem was the following day, so five days before Passover. Um, now, if you go over to Mark, the the, the accounts uh, are, are different in that Mark telescopes or condenses collapses the narrative relative to John. He just mentions that they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then Jesus sends his two disciples and so forth to get the cult. Uh, and so the, these accounts seem to be uh, um, at least partially independent of, of one another. And in, in verse 11, you've got, um, it was already late to send it to Bethany. Uh, he went out to Bethany with the 12, the evening of five days before Passover. The, um, in Mark 13, which I mentioned before, it doesn't even specifically say this is the evening three days before Passover. It's a reasonable inference that's drawn from the fact that the Mount of Olives is midway between Jerusalem, where he's been all day, and Bethany, where his accommodation is for the night. So it, it doesn't look like, uh, and, and remember, Mark doesn't mention uh, that other time, sorry, John doesn't mention that other time stamp uh, that we find in Mark 14, verse 1, about it being two days before the Passover. And John, uh, Mark, doesn't mention uh, six days before Passover or five days before Passover in his chapter 11. And so the the it doesn't look like John is trying to uh, explain Mark or is uh, is uh, trying to uh, dovetail with Mark because readers usually pass over these without noticing them because they're so subtle and so difficult to pick up on. Um, it wasn't discovered to my knowledge until uh, the likes of William Paley and John James Blunt started publishing on these undesigned coincidences. So it's very, very casual and very subtle. So... I guess you didn't quite answer for me what the difference is between, you know, um, two two branches, as it were, of a of an oral tradition that let's say even has some historical core to it. You know, I I I think that Jesus probably was crucified, so there would have been an actual historical chronology of how that week played down. What is the difference between again this this arising from a common oral tradition? versus that they necessarily had to be eyewitnesses. Okay, so just a few points. Uh, and if, you, if anyone wants like the detailed discussion of this, I have a six part essay responding to Richard Carrier, who also has made this point. So it's, not, it's on my website, so go and check that out. But just briefly, a few points. Um, first of all, um, there, there are, there are sometimes discrepancies between these accounts, uh, which suggests that we're not, uh, that, that they're partially independent. So for example, um, that to, to go back to the example I gave with the six days before Passover in John twelve, so uh, there is a there is a small discrepancy um, in Mark chapter fourteen um, and uh, John twelve because in John twelve the uh, the feast that takes place and the anointing of Jesus in Bethany takes place uh, before the triumphal entry. Whereas in Mark, the anointing takes place uh, after the triumphal entry in chapter 14. Uh, and uh, it doesn't look like uh, that one of those sources is uh, intending to narrate a chronologically. It seems to be a very minor good faith mistake as to the order of events. And uh, so that, um, also, I think, strengthens the case uh, for undesigned coincidences when you have these minor uh, discrepancies uh, uh, between the accounts. Um, 
also right, kind of a heads you win, tails you lose thing. Oral tradition. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. It's kind of a heads you win, tails you lose yeah. thing. Both discrepancies and uh, I, well, I, 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 I think, think the both, both discrepancies and differences, uh, both discrepancies and collaboration are both evidence. It's, it seems like. But. Well, I, I actually do think that um, the discrepancies, um, genuine discrepancies, and I think that would be one strong candidate for a genuine discrepancy between Mark and John. Uh, I, I do think that they have multiple epistemic vectors. So um, it it is negatively relevant to the reliability of the text, but it also um, is positively relevant in another sense in that it uh, it points to independence. Uh, and and so it, it, it supports independent attestation and also I think it bolsters uh, the undesigned coincidences found in those in those narratives. Um, so d d does that make sense? Uh it doesn't it doesn't really answer my question of what would be so you you just say casualness so casualness is the answer of how we know the difference between just people who are telling the same story in different ways you know uh versus you know eyewitnesses who 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 were there i, I guess is is that what it comes down to well you're you're there's a number of points that so that's one of them um you're also invoking an additional hypothesis that we don't have independent direct evidence for. So you're saying that there is some underlying source that, that we don't have that contained both of those details and one just preserved one and another source preserved the other. Well, I'm not talking about a source per se. You agreed with me that these, these things were passed on person to person for several decades. Uh, correct. I think there was, there was or, oral tradition. Right. And, and, but that oral tradition need not have been unified to the extent where it was like being recited. You know, they, they made creeds for a reason. They made creeds to make short versions when they were telling the long versions. Are you, are you proposing that they told them the exactly the same way every time? Uh, again, it's, it's the mark of casualness. Uh, so it, in, in the case of, to take another example. Um, so in uh, one one example that uh, we've talked about before is in, in John six five you have the or verse four rather you have um, no John six five you have Jesus asking Philip to at, where do we send the people to buy bread and uh, you wonder why does Jesus turn to Philip in this particular case and you learn in John twelve that Philip's from the town of Bethsaida um, and you only learn in Luke nine parallel account that uh, Philip's um, the, the events taking place in Bethsaida. And so that illuminates, even though Luke doesn't mention Philip. In that sure, context, well, let, me, let me grant you that. Philip, Philip was Merceda, and absolutely, Jesus turned to Philip at that time, and, and that was a real historical thing that happened. The, yeah. Philip, so, Jesus turned, and like, so if, but but what makes that, why is, could that not have been part of an oral tradition that later got codified versus that the person who wrote it down was associated with an eyewitness? Well, again, we're looking for the best explanation, not what was possible, but what's reasonable, what's plausible. And uh, it's, it's the mark of casualness. So John doesn't mention uh, the side of saying the miracle story, which you would expect him uh, to include if he's um, um, if he's emphasizing Philip because Philip's from Bethsaida, you would expect him to mention uh, Bethsaida saying the miracle story, but then he buries in another chapter in chapter 12 and also in chapter one that Philip's from Bethsaida. It, I mean, it's your, your explanation is possible. I just don't think it's the most probable. No, well, but no, but I'm with you. I'm saying, I'm, I'm actually saying there's a historical core. That's where Philip's from. And so that the author of John probably was not in any way trying to clarify anything. He was just honoring a historical kernel that is true. Right. But, but that doesn't mean that the author of John was a witness to this event. That just means that he's aware right. of the historical kernel of truth that Philip was from Bethsaida. But right? you do have very, but you do have very specific details that are preserved so the identity of the of the disciple jesus turned to at the feeding of the five thousand the the specific uh number of days before passover jesus entered bethany and so forth that's a level of specificity which i doubt was preserved in these oral traditions that were circulating in the early years of christianity i, I don't think well, that the early not? i don't think that the oral traditions are some sort of mega gospel that contains all of the accounts uh that we have in the gospels with all the details in just in one big huge gospel uh rather uh, you would uh, you would have um, um, the, the the stories that are in circulation, and, and the this, the the, um, st the stories in the, across, across across the four gospels concerning the feeding of the five thousand, which is the only miracle aside from the resurrection, which is actually found in all four gospels. The the, the details are often different, and there are there are minor uh, apparent discrepancies, or what I call reconcilable variations, which also supports the independence of these accounts. So I, I do think that. Um, 
that the accounts of the feeding of the 5,000 are all drawing upon uh, a common oral tradition. Uh, and then furthermore, there's often cases of undesigned coincidences between different pericopes. Um, and so even supposing that you have different uh, oral traditions that contained these different pericopes, you would still have the undesigned coincidence. Um, so, Right. So, you, so for, for example, you talk about the, how could they have known what Herod was saying to his servants? And the answer comes from one example yeah. where, where the servant, you know, we find out later that one of the servants was, you know, part of the church, for example. Mm -hmm. um, to me, like that, I, I listed some general categories. He's following that sounds like it fits nicely, but it is still speculation, right? You, we don't really know. We're speculating that that is one possible way that the author of Matthew could have known. And forgive me if I'm getting which gospel it was wrong. The author of that gospel, uh, who who recorded what the servants were here was saying to the servants, um, you know, you're. That like a lot of those fall under to me speculation, and so I guess okay. we're going to have a bit of a difference here uh, bet between what is compelling and what's not. I think because I think you're coming toward from these gospels from looking for ways to affirm them, and I'm wanting them to present themselves on their on their own merit. So I, I, let me just shift the conversation a little bit differently, if I may, and we can come back to this. I'm totally cool with coming back to this. What I wanted to do was grant you some stuff. I wanted to perhaps grant that all of the undesigned coincidences, uh, you know, are are as you say they are because because someone told the true story somewhere. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to go all the way that that was eyewitness, but they're all true because the stories that eventually came to the gospel writers were true. Um, how does that tell me that a resurrection happened? versus that um that these stories that it merely could have been people telling stories that it didn't that it happened right what's the undesigned witnesses as far as i can tell aren't related to the actual resurrection appearances the resurrection appearances don't corroborate each other um they don't they don't at, at least in my view they don't attempt to to tell the same story they seem to be trying to elaborate on what first corinthians 15 says um, let's, let's assume that like all, all that stuff about Jesus's ministry, that all actually happened exactly as is in the gospel, all that ministry stuff happened. How does that get us to this resurrection question? What, what am I missing? Where, how do I connect the dots? Okay. So let me just back up a little bit and address one thing you said before, and I'll come directly to that question. Um, so, um, you mentioned, uh, the understanding coincidence between Matthew 14 and Luke 8. So Matthew 14 mentions, uh, that Herod spoke to his servants concerning Jesus saying, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That's why these, uh, miraculous powers are working him. Now, although, uh, Mark, um, also contains that same, uh, pericope, uh, about Herod's statement, Matthew alone as the expression to his servants. And so this suggests that even though you have partial dependence between the accounts, um, unquestionably, there also seems to be a level of independence as well. This is a very common false dichotomy that New Testament scholars make, is that they draw this false dichotomy between dependence or no dependence. And I think that's a false dichotomy. You can have partial dependence and partial independence. And the, the use of the phrase to his servants, which corresponds so well and casually with Luke 8, first three verses, where it mentions among the female disciples of Jesus, Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's household manager, supports that Matthew has independent knowledge besides what he's read in Mark. Um, I also think that the, the, so there's there's many categories besides undesigned coincidences, right? There's also extra biblical confirmations and plenty of those. And so that also, I think, bears on the prior probability in terms of the explanation we give for accounting for the undesigned coincidences, that it supports uh, the testimony hypothesis over the underlying uh, error source or oral tradition hypothesis. Uh, coming back to your question that you just raised, in terms of- I'm gonna derail my, I'm gonna derail my question, just for, I'm okay. sorry. So, yeah. so William Lane Craig and others, you know, posit that, for example, the story in Mark in Matthew, where there's Roman guards, and we we learn about the Roman guards and that they were paid off and all that kind of thing. William Lane Craig and other evangelical scholars will acknowledge that that was whether it was true or not, that was added in in Matthew to answer stories that would have been going around that the disciples stole the body. So that that story was included, true or not, you know, to answer objections um i just when it when you when you bring up you know this example the, the same example you just gave i i guess i just i can't see how that 
automatically falls outside of a different category where the author of Matthew isn't attempting to overcome some of the shortcomings in Mark. Um, do you, do you disagree that that was a thing that happened? Like that, that, that so, things were added in response to objections? I, I do. Um, well, I, no, I don't think any false things were added in response to objections. But um, so in, in, in Matthew, yeah, so you've got these two different hypotheses. Either Matthew is including this expression to his servants, which is not found in Mark, because he's just making that up. He read Mark and then he added those, uh, those statements. And so um, um, you've got a, a redaction at that point. Or... Um, you've got the hypothesis of historical reportage that Matthew actually has independent access to the real events, and so he includes it for that reason. And so then you, then you so to evaluate between those hypotheses, you can look at what we have in Luke, where you have this very casual reference that's completely unconnected in chapter 8 to Joanna, the wife of who's a Herod's household manager. And so then that illuminates, oh, that's how Matthew could come to, could come to know what Herod was saying to his servants. I'm over how, um, why Herod was talking to his servants concerning Jesus. One of Jesus' female disciples is married to someone in the highest ranks of Herod's employment. Uh, so th that would be how I, I would distinguish between those uh, hypotheses. I mean, it's not. I, I'm not saying that it's completely, it completely nails it, but I just think that that is some evidence that is more likely on the hypothesis of historical reportage and independent access to the events and otherwise. Okay. I will, I will let that one sit. I'm sorry to interrupt my own, the answering of my own question. Do we both remember what it even was? Yes. So you <laughs> asked about, um, uh, about what, if you grant all the, for the sake of argument, all yeah, my yeah. Uh, verbal confirmations and so forth, what does that do to the resurrection hypothesis? And I, I do think that it's epistemically relevant uh, because it, as I said in my opening statement, it gets us to a position where we can, um, lay out the trilemma and decide, okay, so w when it comes to any uh, witness testimony, uh, whether we're talking about a sexual assault allegation or a witness to a miracle, whatever it happens to be, there are basically three broad explanatory categories that can give an account of why the person made the claim that they did. One is that they're honestly mistaken, one is that they lied, and one is that they're telling the truth. And in some circumstances, you could have a combination thereof. Um, and so we have to uh, assess those. And um, for the reasons I've already discussed, I, I don't think it's likely that the wrongness is mistaken. If we grant that the Gospels and Acts actually do reflect eyewitness testimony, which the evidence is that I've adduced and that you're granting for the sake of argument, I think provides compelling argument for. Um, if we grant that, then that that renders it quite unlikely that the apostles were honestly mistaken because it shows and su suggests very strongly that the accounts in the Gospels and Acts concerning the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters actually reflects the unembellished testimony of those who were purported the eyewitnesses. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the, the context of persecution, which also provides evidence that confirms the sincerity of the apostles and so renders the resurrection the most probable explanation of the pertinent facts. So walk me through. So uh, it I'm going to Spider-Man fallacy here for a minute. I'm just going to, mm. I'm going to ruin myself with the, my terrible argument of our Spider-Man fallacy. So I, I guess I don't get how um, all the, having a bunch of mundane facts that line up with things gets me to, because, because I'm not granting that, you know, the whole book is, is true. What I was granting is that all the, the little individual details, all the individual alignments, you know, we're, we're, go back to a historical core, not necessarily that the eyewitness wrote it. Because I don't, you know, even you wouldn't say that Mark or Luke, for example, were eyewitnesses. They were reporting what was told to them, right? They're at least secondhand um, reportage. So... Um, uh, they are secondhand, but I would argue that they're very, they're very close up to people who were firsthand. Cool. Yeah. I, I don't think so, but that that's neither here nor there. I mean, so, but I guess I can, I can still grant that the, all those little details go back to historical cores that, you know, that, that the life of the ministry of Jesus was, you know, documented in a way that was, that was well-documented. Um, I, I don't get how the, that tells me that the other part of the story is true. So, you know, we, we look at a lot of, in, in historical writing, there are, there's, um, there's embellishments. Now I know that People think that the Gospels aren't of the genre uh, that, that includes embellishments, although Michael Icona might would disagree and others. Um, why am I to think that, you know, that all those other details are, are to tell me that the resurrection actually had to happen versus someone could be sincerely mistaken about it? Uh, for the reason I gave previously, um, in, ter okay, in terms so of the it's, it's that they were that you think that they were genuinely the authors were genuinely trying to be reliable.
Exactly. That's what the evidence that you're granting for the sake of argument, I think, shows. Okay. Um, and I hope that the audience would you know, I, go, go along with me that I, I don't see how that crosses any kind of threshold. I don't see how adding all those things up gets me over any kind of threshold that the person necessarily had to be an eyewitness. I don't see how that can't be, again, kern kernels of historical truth, uh, details added for pure verisimilitude, details added to answer objections. These all seem, I don't see how anyone can ever take sincerely mistaken off the table when it comes to any story. I might be inclined to agree with you that it's consistent with mere kernels of truth. Uh, if it were the case that there was only a small sample of examples of these sorts of historical confirmations, but there are scores and scores of them, crisscrossing the documents, crisscrossing the gospels and extra biblical secular sources, crisscrossing acts and letters of Paul, crisscrossing acts and external secular sources, unexplained allusions, the express, the, the um, artless similarities I talked about. I mean, there's just so many of those and they often involve very particular minor peripheral details that uh, in my judgment, the, the best explanation is that these actually do reflect, reflect historical details, historically true facts. And there's an inductive argument that given that there's so many points of the where you can actually confirm uh, and historically cross check these sources that provides an indirect um, pr um, inductive justification for thinking that the the sources as a whole are substantially trustworthy and that they are actually trying um, to, to accurately represent what happened. So, you know, one example you gave an illusion was um, Rufus and I forget the name of the other individual in the Alexander. <laughs> Alexander Rufus, thank you. Uh, Alexander Rufus, and, and you know, it said, well, if he includes these details, wouldn't that be the kind of detail that someone could check up on or, or know about it? Um, and again, this this to me just flies in, in the, I, I don't see why this can't be someone adding details for verisimilitude, whether or not Alexander Rufus were actual people, because again, we are talking decades later. Uh, we don't know if these people were still around or still well known or whatever, uh, or, how am I, you know, how are we supposed to rule out the idea that Alexander and Rufus totally started spreading, when the stories about Jesus started spreading, that they didn't insert themselves into these stories for the sake of attention, and it became part of the oral tradition that they were there. I guess, like, for me, these are just constantly things that I don't understand why I'm supposed to value that there were eyewitnesses versus these other very plausible to me reasons and I don't need to come up with them each ad hoc. They're like the categories I gave, they all seem to possibly fit in. Um, but I think that's just going to be a difference between us, how well we value those details. But you did mention martyrs and I would love to talk about where we agree or disagree on martyr testimony. Are you okay shifting away to that for a while? Sure. Can I just comment on what you said first? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, in terms of the Alexander and Rufus incident in Mark 15, and I give that as an example of an unexplained allusion, um, the argument is not merely that uh, these would presumably have been individuals that are known to the original audience. And if you're trying to make up a story or fictionalize a narrative, if you try to minimize unnecessary details, um, especially not include things that can be um, checked up on. And so, it, it, again, it's, it is, has a ring of verisimilitude for that reason. And also, uh, the the, the the reason that it has a ring of verisimilitude that I stress in my opening statement is that uh, it, Rufus and Alexander played no further role in the Gospels, or for that matter, in the Book of Acts. And so, it uh, you would suspect under these sort of scenarios that you provided that you might that th there might be some further connection that these individuals have to the story in some capacity, and, and they, they just don't. And so, again, while your explanation is possible, um, I don't think it's a reasonable or plausible one. It seems to me to be ad hoc. And uh, I think that you often uh, equivocate between uh, having a, a possible explanation that's logically possible um, versus one that is reasonable and plausible based on the data that we're observing. Well, we are coming at these with very different hypotheses, right? So, you, so my hypothesis is, does this, does this look like stories that were told for a long time and then written down at different times by different authors with different agendas? And all of these things scream to me, yes, that's what happened. Um, and but you are, but I, I also agree that I like an that they were actual eyewitnesses. Um, also fits the data, right? Like I'm not trying to deny that uh, 
the, these being actual eyewitness accounts doesn't match the data. Um, that we would agree though. So I have a stumbling block that you don't have, and that is that I don't accept miracle claims without very without significant evidence that overcomes my worldview. Right? I don't. I'm not a. I'm not a naturalist in the sense that I'm not a philosophical naturalist that denies that supernatural can happen. I just think it's the least possible. It's the least likely thing that can happen. And in from my study of history. It also seems to be a thing that history can never actually f give us adequate information, adequate so, uh, evidence to overcome, you know, that objection. It's th someone's sincerely mistaken to me is always going to be more likely that a miracle happened. Right. So, and that's, that's, that, that's a very important difference. And uh, th so there's, there's basically two issues here that we should discuss. Uh, there's the David Hume issue that you just alluded to. And then there's uh, the argument from martyrdom and i would like to if we can uh, discuss both which would you like to begin with whichever order you like i'm i'm cool um okay let's, let's start with martyrdom and then move on to david Hume. okay so, okay. so you can where do we up. agree on martyrdom i I've, I've heard you say some things about martyrdom it sounds like you might agree with me for example that peter and paul uh if nero actually was did you know looking for scapegoats that Peter and Paul's martyrdom can't tell us a lot about um, what they believed or what they were willing to recant. Is the, am I right in thinking that we might agree slightly there? Yeah. Um, so um, I, I take a slightly more nuanced uh, argument uh, from martyrdom than you'll hear from some other apologists. Uh, so I, I'm not arguing for the specific martyrdom of the apostles as evidence for their sincerity. Um, I think that we do have good evidence for the martyrdom of Peter, Paul, James, the son of Zebedee, James, the brother of Jesus, and that's about it. Um, yeah. And as you rightly, we agree as you, as you, right, right. As you yeah. rightly said, as you rightly said, um, so Tacitus tells us that in 64 AD, there was a fire that broke out in Rome. And uh, there was this rumor circulating among the Jews that uh, the the fire had been the result of an order uh, by Nero himself. And so he had to find a scapegoat to blame for the fire. And so he said, well, the, the Christians, they've angered the gods. They're to blame for the fire. Go get them. And so Christians were um, persecuted fiercely under the Emperor Nero uh, from 64 AD onwards. And um, Peter and Paul, as you rightly said, seem to have got caught up in that persecution. And it seems that Nero's motivations for persecuting the Christians was not so much theological precision, uh, but it, rather it was political. He needed a scapegoat. So I, I, I do think that that uh, does reduce the evidential value of their of the specific fact that they're martyred. There's no reason at all, in fact, some reason to think otherwise, that the apostles uh, that were persecuted under Nero, Peter, Paul, etc., were given no opportunity to recant. There, there's reason to think that they probably weren't right. given um, opportunity to recant and no reason to think cool. that there is. So, um, so we, we agree there. Uh, the way that I would structure the argument for martyrdom, and I do have an essay on my website if anyone wants further details on this, um, is um, the way that Paley structured the argument. Uh, I, I read a quote from Paley earlier that the early apostles were willing to voluntarily undergo and endure sufferings, hardships, imprisonments, dangers, and so forth on account of their testimony. And that goes a long way towards establishing, it doesn't prove, but it goes a long way towards establishing that they were at least sincere. And um, we, we have good reason to think that the book of Acts is substantially trustworthy, that it was written by a compa traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. And we have accounts in the book of Acts concerning the imprisonment of John and Peter, for example, uh, the stoning of Stephen, although it, he wasn't necessarily a resurrection witness, but it does show you the de general uh, context of persecution. You also have tremendous evidence for the uh, the um, so the persecutions of Paul, especially in Paul's own letters, as well as Acts and Clement of Rome, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that uh, that, uh, Paul's Acts 9 conversion experience on the road to Damascus also provides you with some independent uh, con confirmatory evidence for the resurrection. So uh, so it's the, it's the general context of danger and persecution and imprisonments and so forth that I would appeal to more so than the specific martyrdom of any one apostle. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I have two, two follow-up questions, and one is going to be assuming Acts is reliable, and one's going to be assuming it's not. So let's, or let's say we're setting Acts aside for my first question. Acts aside... What are the names of any uh, eyewitnesses to resurrected Jesus 
who we have record of them going out and preaching and like accurate, you know, what we would consider to be reliable evidence. What are their names? How do we know they actually <laughs> preach and put themselves on the line like you suggest? So I, I'm not going to grant you acts aside because I think that the evidence is overwhelming for uh, Luke Acts okay. being reliable. So the, the evidence is entirely in acts. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. The evidence is no, entirely we, we, in acts. We do also have, I mean, Clement of Rome does make allusion to it in uh, chapter five of First Clement as well. Yeah, I, I don't think Clement was in a position to know firsthand. And I, I would think you probably agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean... It, I, um, I mean, it's debated as to whether Clement knew the apostles firsthand. I, I tend to think he did. Um, and there's a number of reasons I have for that. Uh, I, it, it seems to me to be quite plausible that uh, the Clement, for example, mentioned in Philippians 4 is Clement of Rome, especially given that uh, Philippians was written from Rome during Paul's imprisonment. Gotcha. Yeah, you're not surprised to hear that I have the opposite view, but that's that's all fine. Well and good. So only Acts tells us that the that there are eyewitnesses who actually are willing to put their lives on the line. So, you know, in the spirit of for the Bible tells me so, that's the same author of the book of Luke. So, you know, it's all really one one big book, so it's all part of the same thing there. But that's fine. As far as I can tell in the book of Acts, after around chapter four the apostles the the 12 disciples the 12 people and if even if include matthias right um who, who replaced judas they kind of disappear from acts uh, save for peter and john would you agree correct mm -hmm. so you're not making i assume you're not and, saying that any well, of those are ones mm -hmm. that you would name by name to say well that person was willing to suffer and die right because we don't know what happened to them um, so, so, as I said before, the, the nuanced argument that I'm going to make from martyrdom is to do with the general context of persecution. We can't give specific examples. I, I mentioned no, I, I, and, but and I just John even willing to die. Like, I don't know that Bartholomew did anything after, right. after chapter four. But the, but the early apostles who, who, who wrote the, so the, the, um, gospel authors, uh, who, relayed the stories uh, or the the ones from whom the stories came concerning the resurrection they certainly were uh, proclaiming the resurrection of jesus and they were willing to be persecuted on as uh, on account of that and when they're uh, given the general persecution against the early christian movement the ones who are going to be most subject to persecution are the leaders of the christian movement which would include people like peter paul uh, james the brother of jesus john uh, and so forth and we do have records in the book of acts of peter john um stephen uh, preaching um paul um and uh, james the brother of jesus and so forth and uh, james the son of zebedee of course is beheaded um by herod agrippa in acts uh, 12 as well right but so we we, we we talked about those four as martyrs and i guess you know you you didn't even want to you wanted to go to the willing to die argument and like do you add any new names to this list by going to the willing to die argument i i gave you a various names just a moment ago i i thought we i thought it was just the same four names as the martyrs i thought it was just you just you just said james rather jesus paul I mean, okay so I'd, I'd, kind of... I'd also add john uh so john, john is also person, cool right? all right all right so so i and i actually am with you on uh, John needs an explanation, John, because John was there in Galatians, right? In 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 the, he met Paul, so John needs needs some kind of accounting. Um, so I guess I'm just not seeing where this willing to die argument um, gets me further along than if I just accept that Acts and Luke are reliable, I've got the resurrection already. So I no, guess I'm no, unclear no, as to how. What? Sorry. It, it doesn't follow. It doesn't doesn't follow logically. So, so I'm, I'm not making a circular argument that the resurrection account is reliable. Therefore, Jesus rose from the dead. Mm. Of course, that the resurrection account is reliable. Jesus rose from the dead. Um, and Dale Allison, as you know, in in his book on the resurrection, charges the maximal data theorists like myself with that sort of begging the question fallacy. And sure, uh, and I, I guess I, I wasn't give, trying to do that. I guess I was just I was wanting to know what this willing to die adds. Like, let's say I'm already on board. If I'm already on board with the that these are reliable documents, do I actually even need the willing to die argument? It doesn't seem like I do. Yeah, and um, so 
we quit. So, so let me express the argument again so you can see what I'm actually saying. So I'm saying that what we have in the Gospels actually reflects eyewitness testimony. If that's mm -hmm. the case, that doesn't necessarily entail the resurrection. This is a very common objection, okay. uh, technically correct, that atheists will make against uh, the maximal data approach. Uh, that demonstration of numerous mundane facts in the Gospels doesn't entail the resurrection took place. I completely agree with that. However, awesome. good. it is epistemically relevant to whether Jesus rose from the dead for the reason that I gave in my opening statement, namely that uh, it, it gets us to a place where we can run the trilemma to see which best explains the nature and variety of the claims concerning the resurrection that we find in the Gospels and Acts. And uh, as for the reasons I give, have given already, I think the resurrection is the best explanation thereof. Okay. So you, you gave me the names of the, the, the people willing to die. You gave me those five names. Is that, is that, am I right? And did I hear correctly that you gave me five names? And indeed that there's a general context of persecution, uh, but yes. Oh, they, I, I'm totally on board with the context of persecution. I guess right. I'm all, my hang up is when apologists use this to say when they when they try and over sweep and just use the words like apostles and disciples. But, I, you know, but I want I want the name. So you gave me the five names. We already talked about how um, Peter and, you know, they they were they were definitely willing to die. And I'm, I hypothesized that Peter was likely the person who was um, was sincerely mistaken. Is it? So to you, is it completely implausible that five people could be sincerely mistaken? Well, again, you have to look at the particulars of the case, right? So you have to look at uh, um, what is it that they're claiming? And uh, if they're, what they're claiming is sufficiently detailed and sufficient, and it's sufficiently implausible that they could have been honestly mistaken about that. I mean, Tim McGrew, uh, my colleague, has, as an analogy sometimes gives, uh, think back to a time in, perhaps in over the summer during high school when you were hanging out with a, a friend that you used to hang out with um, perhaps having lunch with them or something um, and do you think that you could testify under oath that this was in fact your friend and not someone else and that they were in fact alive and not dead well sure and the reason for that is because it's very difficult to be honestly mistaken about that sort of thing um yeah i i'm with you um i guess for me the the gap here is the evidence of what where i was trying to go was what were these what do we know that these five were saying? We know what Paul was saying. He has seven letters. I don't know what Peter was saying. I don't know what James, the brother of Jesus was saying. I don't know what James, son of Zebedee was saying. I don't, I don't accept that John was the author of John. So I don't know what he was saying. Um, but let's pull John off the table because you absolutely do. That would be your answer is how we know what John was saying. How do we know that those other three were making claims that I should be confident in this about? Well, we're talking about the claims that we have in the Gospels and Acts. And I, as I said, we we have the general context of persecution so that the those that did make the claim of the resurrection, which as we've seen uh, the the claims that we have in the Gospels and Acts, uh, and I, I would argue also in, in the Pawning Corpus, go back to individuals who are, um, who are eyewitnesses. And we have this general context of persecution. And so uh, given that their, their willingness to proclaim in the midst of such dangers um, and uh, persecution and uh, threat of martyrdom and so forth, that provides a uh, compelling reason to think that they were at least sincere. It's not, and, and don't get me wrong, as I said, it doesn't secure their sincerity, but it is considerable evidence thereof. And you also have additional evidence that further, I think, supports their sincerity. So for example, um, um, the fact that uh, the, Gospels consist of women as the chief discoveries of the empty tomb, I do think has evidential value in confirming uh, their sincerity because it would be unlikely to invent that uh, if uh, if they're fictionalizing the account. Again, it doesn't secure it, but it, it is more it's more surprising if they're fictionalizing than otherwise. Hard disagree and actually even disagree with the word fictionalizing because I think that these are stories that grew by people who actually absolutely believed them at every single stage. I think that is the best hypothesis that everyone was sincere, but they were they were adding on details to to win their friends over. Like I, that's that's sort of where I'm at. But I don't want to get off the fact that how do I know what James, the brother of Jesus, was teaching? Like I don't think the Book uh, of Acts tells me. Well, we have James being the leader of the Jerusalem Church, and uh, we also know that. Luke uh, was present with Paul in Acts 21 when he visits the Jerusalem 
elders, the Jerusalem leaders, and it mentions that all the Jerusalem elders are present, including it specifically mentions James. And, uh, and so Luke was in a position to know what James was teaching. And Luke, of course, was, in pres- was present with Paul during Paul's imprisonment in Caesarea Maritima for at least two years, uh, which is quite close to Jerusalem. So he would have had access, presumably, to those witnesses um, during that time. Furthermore, uh, Paul in Galatians 1 mentions uh, James, the brother of Jesus, whom he met uh, in Jerusalem, and he mentions uh, two occasions uh, where he met with the Jerusalem leaders, uh, and mentions James specifically, and uh, mentions that the Jerusalem leaders had nothing to add to his gospel, um, and so that suggests that what they're preaching is aligned substantially with with what they're teaching. Uh, that Paul is the appointed apostle to the Gentiles, whereas they are um, preaching to the Jews. I actually think that that these men added nothing to my message means entirely something different, and that Paul is very proud of the fact he says a few verses before that that no human told him what his message was. And I, I, I'm i with other people who take that passage as saying, these men had nothing to my message, means that the, the right hand of fellowship doesn't mean that they agreed on what it was. That neither, That's all aside. So mm-hmm. I, I lost my way. So well, Acts, to, to just squarely respond to that. So um, we look at other texts though, when Paul is talking about um, Peter and James and so forth, and we can see further that, that further supports uh, the interpretation that I'm giving. Um, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 11, he says, whether then it was I or they, speak, referring back to Peter and James and the, the apostles, so we preach and so you believed. Uh, in um, 1 Corinthians 1 also, he says, some say I follow Kephas, others Apollos, others I follow Christ, others I follow Paul, others, others I follow Christ. But uh, he basically says, guys, we're all on the same team here. Um, and so that suggests that he is sig- substantially aligned with what the other apostles, including Peter or James, are teaching. But we still don't have, I still don't have a good source about what they're teaching, right? I'm, I'm getting these general senses from books that I don't count as reliable, that I think are the claim, not the evidence for the claim. Um, that both. I, I understand that it can be both, but it, you can't separate the fact that it's a, it's a, it is a single source, you know, in that way. Um, that we have a single source for what, for what they're preaching. Um, and like for me, I just don't get it. Like it, I don't. Have, for me, have you? It's not enough, it's not, we don't have for this whole willing to die thing. You have to tell me. You have to show me where these people. And I don't, I don't even know that. I don't have James in his own words telling me that he saw a resurrected Jesus. I don't have Peter in his own words telling me. Well, you think that Peter? Sorry, you would say that Mark does that. Anyway, I'll let you respond. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just um, blanking what I was going to say. Um, oh, yeah, I was going to ask, um, have you um, have you read much on the subject of the evidence for uh, Luke being a traveling companion of Paul, such as the undesigned coincidences, extra biblical confirmations, and uh, other um, factors that bear on um, Luke being indeed a traveling companion of Paul? So uh, not as much as I should, and I will be more in the future. However, I, I do I do take I do accept that the there are we pass it like the start of Luke. He talk he says my former book of office. Um, no, that's the start of Acts. My former book of office. He's talking about how he has all these sources. So I actually do think the Luke, the author of Luke, pulled from all kinds of sources. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, it makes total equal sense that the we passages in Acts, you know, are from a source from a single person. That that does not, for me, validate that the whole thing is a source. Um, there are also, and I, I'm sorry that they're not coming to mind. I have notes on this though, enumerating where different places where Acts seems to brush against uh, the, the letters of, of Paul. Um, so I, I'm not persuaded by that argument, but I will admit that it is one I need to study deeper. Uh, just the, the main arguments that I've heard before, including you know that the 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 wind the the water currents in certain levels or something that you wouldn't know unless you were local and all those kind of things you know for me I can still grant that Luke used sources that were local to that and not necessarily apply this again you you like to not you like to uh, it seems like you would like me to paint a broad brush of saying that if it's accurate here that it's accurate across the board and I don't want to treat that document any of the documents in in that monolithic fashion right that that one pericope can be true and one pericope can be false 
So I, I agree with that in principle, but I disagree with the pericope by pericope approach to historiography because I think that you can make an inductive argument where you treat these documents as, as whole sources, as whole documents, and uh, that you can make an inductive case for treating a document as being substantially trustworthy. So if it gets the, the, the facts that you can cross-check correct, then that gives you an inductive justification for trusting those sources, even on those details that you cannot directly cross-check. It's indirect evidence. Um, and I mean, there's, there's uh, in William Paley's book, Cara Polanyi, he documents over 40 examples just, um, between the Book of Acts and the Letters of Paul of undesigned coincidences. Um, you can also, if you read uh, Colin Hemer's work, The Book of Acts and the Setting of Hellenistic History, he gives, he gives uh, 84 uh, details and acts that are that, that are historically confirmed uh, extra biblically that support that the author really knows uh, what he's talking about in terms of the culture, customs, religion, um, geography, and so forth. And we're not—I mean, we're not talking about big picture details like who was the emperor at the time and things like that. We're talking about very minor and very specific details that are hard things to get right, and, and therefore support the historicity of the of the narrative. But from a historian perspective, you have. Are there, I don't know of any other work that historians unilaterally say this work as a whole is reliable or unreliable. For me, if, if that's, a, if that's where you want to put the gospels, for me, that's, that's a, that's the first case in history where someone's saying, well, this document is just reliable across the board. Like that doesn't seem like a thing that a historian would say. It doesn't matter to me what historians, in fact, do. What matters to me is what they ought to do. Right? And so in this in this case, I'd say this is good historical practice. I mean, a similar um, thing in, in scholarship that I often strongly disagree with is the disdain for harmonization, which I think is a very good historical practice. And so regardless of whether scholars like to harmonize, uh, I think they should like to harmonize. And so I, I completely, uh, it doesn't impress me to say scholars do this or don't do that. What impresses me is what, an argument for what they ought to be doing. And I think that treating them in this manner is good historical practice. Okay. So you, you disagree with how historians treat history on this point. I, I disagree in particular with how gospel scholars treat the gospels in this pericope by pericope approach. I mean, you do see um, so sources that are often said to be uh, generally trustworthy or generally untrustworthy. For example, uh, Josephus tends to be trustworthy on things that were within his own lifetime, uh, but le far less trustworthy when he's, talk when he's reaching back into the past uh, before his time um, and so forth. But I think that the Gospels and Acts are incredibly trustworthy as documented by the numerous uh, points of historical confirmation that, that I've alluded to many times. So uh, you're, you're saying that the Gospels and Acts are a special case in history that no... That, how is this not special pleading? Because uh, I'm appealing to evidence to show that the Gospels and Acts are incredibly historical, historically reliable. And I would say um, of a very, very, um, they're, they're at a very, very high tier in terms of their historical reliability. Are they the most historically, are, they, are there no other documents in history that attempted to be as accurate as they did? Um, I would be surprised. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if the I, I would not be surprised if the Gospels and Acts are among the most, if not the most, uh, uh, historically trustworthy um, sources from that time period. Okay. Uh, what do you, What do you well, guys I think have, about I, returning? I have a jingle for that, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> what What do you guys think about returning to the uh, the Hume question and then doing some sure. Q &A? I think that sure. leads into it well because because okay. Because where I think, I think obviously that the, the, the gospels can be accurate in many things, but completely wrong about the miracles. So um, that leads directly into it. Jonathan, why don't you, I think you had a response you wanted to say about my Hume quote. Yeah, let's talk about there. Hume. Uh, so there's a number of problems I have with Hume. Um, one of the biggest ones is that, so, so David Hume uh, isn't necessarily saying that miracles don't happen and ruling it out a priori. Rather, he's saying that even if a miracle did occur, you can't justifiably come to the conclusion that a miracle has occurred in history because a miracle by its very nature is the least probable explanation uh, because uh, it, otherwise it wouldn't be a miracle. That's, that's the very nature of the case. Right. That was and my so last slide, everyone... actually. I, don't, I didn't read it out loud, but that was actually the, the basis of my last slide mm -hmm. on my presentation. So you can go back. Yep. Right. 
Carry on. Yeah, and he has many many contemporary defenders. Bart Ehrman likes to express the argument like that as well. There's the expression or the slogan that uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence that goes back to Carl Sagan, of course, um, which is a very popular expression of Hume. Now, um, one of my main criticisms of David Hume is that if we um, if we take the hypothesis that God has wrought miracles in history as authenticating signs, um, which is the claim of both the Old and New Testaments, then it has to be the case that miracles deviate from the normal course of nature, the way nature normally behaves when left to itself, because if they didn't, then they would be robbed of their evidential value in terms of confirming a divine messenger. So that's that's the purpose for which miracles are wrought. John even refers to them as, as signs in his gospel, because they're meant to attest to Jesus' divine identity, uh, messianic identity. Um, they're, all, they're also said to confirm apostolic messengers. Um, for example, in 2 Corinthians um, 11, Paul refers to uh, his own um, signs, of an, signs of a true apostle performed in the midst of the Corinthians, um, or is it chapter 12? Uh, chapter 12. Um, and um, you also have in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 18, uh, says, that how, how do you know whether a prophet truly speaks from God? Well, it's the, it's the accuracy with which he forecasts the future ahead of time. So these are meant as authenticating signs. And, and so we shouldn't be too surprised then as they deviate f- recognizably from the normal course of nature. And so the fact they, they do, in fact, deviate in that way from the normal course of nature, the way nature behaves when left to itself, can't really be taken to, as a serious blow to the hypothesis that God has used miracles as authenticating signs. So we have to look to other considerations to assess the prior probability or the intrinsic plausibility of God performing a miracle in Jesus' case. And I would argue that um, we can look at the ar- other categories of evidence for Christianity besides the resurrection to give us that theo uh, religious historical context that um, is um, significantly positively relevant to the prior probability of God performing a miracle in Jesus' case, such as the the evidence bearing on the conversion of the Apostle Paul. I recommend George Littleton's book on that subject, The Observations in the Conversion of St. Paul. Uh, um, Also the argument for Messianic prophecy, the trilemma argument that C.S. Lewis uh, is most famously associated with, um, uh, the argument from contemporary miracles, the argument uh, from the survival of the nation of Israel against the laws and so forth. And given that we have independent reason to think Christianity is true, that in turn uh, informs our assessment of the prior probability of God performing a miracle case, a miracle in Jesus' case specifically. Uh, and of course, that that prior probability that that assumption hasn't been made on my part. So my prior probability is definitely going to be different than yours. Um, but I, I still don't get how, in any miracle claim, be it a miracle claim from yesterday or a miracle claim from thousands of years ago, that I can put that it actually happened ahead of someone is mistaken or someone is lying. Because on every single day, millions of people are mistaken, millions of people lie, but on any given day, there can't be millions of miracles. There's probably only a few miracles. So I cannot see how that can ever become more likely than those two things that are mundane. So your your frequentist approach is, I think, inappropriate for the reason that I've already given, that uh, you, you it's, it's highly predicted on the hypothesis that miracles are not going to be a very common occurrence. They're going to recognizably deviate from the way nature normally behaves. Um, and so the fact that you observe that, given that it's so highly expected on the hypothesis, can be a significant objection to the hypothesis in question. But the evidence given for these miracles is the exact same kind of evidence that would be given for someone sincerely mistaken. The sincerely mistaken person is going to leave the exact same kind of testimony indistinguishable from the, that the miracle I, I disagree. actually happened. <clears throat> I disagree completely. Um, Again, we have to look at the particulars of the case. When it, I mean, for example, I think that it's much more plausible to be sincerely mistaken about the miracles or pseudo purported miracles of um, Sai Baba than it, uh, materializing watches and things like that, than it is to be sincerely mistaken about the resurrection, given the nature of the claims that are being made. The, the sorts of claims that we find in the Gospels and Acts are, are the sorts of claims about which it's very, very difficult to be honestly mistaken. Um, and so I, I, I don't think that these are the same. It's, I mean, as, as, as we agreed upon earlier, it's much more plausible to be honestly mistaken about a, um, a Jesus that appears momentarily or very a great distance and di- disappears or, and so forth than it is about the sorts of claims we find in the Gospels and Acts. Well, you are, I guess, I, sh- I should clarify that the, the thing I said before was was only when when testimony is the major source of the witness. I, I would agree that a miracle claim from yesterday, if there was uh, medical documentation, all that kind of thing, that could absolutely raise the significance. So I, I, I do want to just, lest anyone accuse me of uh, anything weird there, I, I do mean when it's based on testimony alone. Uh, 
that said, I, I guess I just can't come with you that the Gospels are necessarily testimony versus stories that grew. Like stories that grew has equal explanatory power as far as I can tell. And I've yet to hear anything today that tells me that they have different explanatory power. You just want to also say, and I think we're both on the same boat, so I'm not criticizing you. The data seems to fit my hypothesis that, and the data seems to fit your hypothesis. And if I, because I, I, I don't go along with you on the casualness thing. Um, so I guess on this Hume thing, uh, the, I guess we're just saying, even if that miracle happened, it doesn't seem like testimony could ever be relied on. Uh, and you're talking about subtleness of testimony. I just can't come with you, I guess, that, that there's a type of testimony that ever will seem more likely than someone being sincerely mistaken. Well, that, that's just mathematically false, right? Because um, test, if testimony conveys some evidential value in confirming a, a particular proposition, then uh, there has to be a certain level of, of testimony in terms of quantity and quality that will overcome the initial intrinsically low prior probability of the miracle itself. I'm not sure for me there is, and I, that's, a, that's an admission. I'm not sure for me there is an amount of testimony that could be because I qualify it all, you know, in that same in that same broad sense versus my probable prior, prior probably about uh, methodological naturalism. But also, for me, the Gospels don't even come close to where that hypothetical line would be. Again, these all seem derivative of the same oral tradition to me. Uh, and so multiplying it out by four authors many decades later, uh, who told their own variations, I've yet to be convinced that those are independent. So I, maybe if you had a hundred different independent cases, uh, I would say that something happened. I guess I still wouldn't be able to say that they're all attributing it to the, to the right thing. I don't know. Uh, this is a worldview difference that you and I have that I'm not sure will be overcome here. All right. Maybe we could move on to Q and A if, if Cameron's willing to do that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good, seems like a good opportunity to, to switch gears here. So, uh, we've only had one super chat come in. So what I'll do is I'll just let the audience know that we're going to switch to a period of Q and A. So if you'd like to make sure that your question is asked and answered today on the stream, sending in it as a super chat is one of the best ways to make sure that that happens. We also seem to have a whole lot of comments coming in today on, on the stream. So it's going to be difficult to kind of wade through the comments, sending it as a super chat, just kind of makes it easier on me to find them, but you don't have to send a question as a super chat. Um, it, but if you do have a question for either Jonathan or Paul, then leave it in the live chat. I'll do what I can to try to monitor the live chat, listen to them and, and do 10 things at once. But, um, yeah, that's what we're doing. Here's the first one from Grays174. Jonathan, have you put the time have you put in the time to find undesigned coincidences in texts that we know aren't eyewitness testimony? If so, which texts? Yeah, so this is a good question. I, I do think that there are any examples of this sort of feature in, say, the, the apocryphal gospels, the, the, the Gnostic gospels of the second, third, fourth centuries. Uh, if anyone is willing to put forward a test case, I would be very keen to see it. Um, while we're still, oh, we actually did get some more questions come in. So we'll, we'll turn to those now. So this one's from testify capturing Christianity. Does Jonathan have a few good examples of modern miracle reports? Yeah. So, um, there's, uh, some good literature on the subject. If people want, uh, to do a deep dive, I recommend Craig Keener's, uh, work, uh, in particular, his more recent popularization of his previous work, uh, his, Mir uh, his, a bit called miracles today. Um, which uh, documents some of the stronger examples. His previous uh, two-volume set uh, on contemporary miracles, uh, I think it's just called Miracles, uh, Volume 1 and 2, is uh, is a mixed bag of good and, and weak, weaker examples. Um, I also recommend uh, Lee Strobel's um, popular level work uh, called uh, The Case for Miracles. Um, I don't agree with all of Lee Strobel's work, but I think that's a great book. Um, I also like um, Robert Larmer's done some great work on this subject, as has J.P. Moreland. Um, but yeah, there, there are plenty of examples. One example that comes to mind, uh, for instance, is Barbara Snyder's case of healing from multiple sclerosis uh, when she was uh, comp completely paralyzed and, and um, blind and uh, her, her feet had curled up and, uh, and so forth. And she there was uh, 
request this this is discussed in Lee Strobel's book uh, the case for miracles and Craig Keener interviewed her and uh she talks about how she uh th there was a prayer request sent into a radio station for people to pray for Barbara and someone was reading prayer cards to her at the hospital and then she reports that she heard this voice saying um my child get up and walk and so she was able to get up out of bed put her feet on the floor they were completely flat she was able to see again and uh she has um and she she was able to go into the prayer meeting at her church and to the shock of her church church congregation and at the time of the publication of lee strobel's book the case for miracles this uh had been uh, she'd been persistently healed of, of ms for more than 35 years and so it doesn't it it seems that her multiple sclerosis was too far advanced to be for it to be plausibly the result of um of um, relapsing and remission ms and uh, given the fact that it's endured for 35 years that seems to undermine that hypothesis as well and then also given the fact that it took place in the context of prayer so the arms from contemporary miracles i think is also positively relevant to our assessment of the intrinsic plausibility that god might perform a miracle in jesus case and actually david Hume's argument i would suggest is circular in that he says that the reason that miracles are so implausible is because they run against uniform human testimony but then he has to run that argument against all of the human testimony that does in fact test to uh, miracle occurrences because testimony is not uniform as Craig Keener points out. So somewhere my partner Shannon Q is screaming about that example from multiple sclerosis as my partner Shannon Q has multiple sclerosis and has looked into that one quite a lot and uh, you can check her channel to find out what she says and I would also encourage you if you are in, if you're impressed by Lee Strobel's Case for Miracles to go watch my video on Case for Miracles in which I go ahead and look at each miracle case that he puts forth in his film and uh, why they are thoroughly unimpressing to me. So, yeah, that's just the other side of it. All right, we've had some more Super Chats come in, so we'll get through those. Uh, T for for Shen, hope I'm saying that correctly. Paul, if the Shroud of Turin turned out to be 100% authentic, would this change anything for you? So you'd have to, I guess I need to know what authentic would mean. So if authentic meant, for example, that it was, you know, from the first century, uh, that wouldn't necessarily tell me that it was on Jesus's body. Um, and even if the radiation or whatever is weird, I don't know that we can point specifically to that, you know, resurrection requires specific, forgive me if that's, if radiation isn't the best current leading example. I don't, I don't know a lot about the Shroud of Turin. I am waiting for Christians to largely affirm the Shroud of Turin before I invest my time on it. Uh, no, I don't think it would because it doesn't seem to singularly point to either Jesus or a resurrection. Like there seems to be plenty of other things that even if it was a weird thing that it could be, but uh, if Christians en masse decide that it's valid, I will look into it more. Maybe by authentic, he means like it was Jesus's shroud. Like it was the shroud. I guess I don't, was, I don't know how we could know that. It's kind of like the same way, like I ask sometimes, how would you falsify Christianity? And people are like, well, if you find Jesus's bones, I'm like, well, in what possible world would I bring out a collection of bones and someone said, yep, these are Jesus's. Like we, this, it just, I don't see how you could make that connection we don't have jesus's dna tough to know yeah okay uh let's move on to question from jeff cochran I, again i hope i'm saying that correctly uh capturing christianity do you believe that you apply the same standard of evidence to other supernatural claims that you do to those in the bible so question for jonathan um i i do so there's um there's a good book published in uh the 1700s by a guy called john douglas and the book's called the criterion and he puts forward a set of uh religiously neutral criteria by which you can uh discern whether a miracle uh, is a worthy place to begin investigating or is worthy of your time and the criteria that he put forward are number one uh, so th these are criteria for dismissing a miracle um, as not being worthy of investigation and um, number one is if the uh if the first reports concerning the miracle uh come long after the event is supposed to have taken place number two if the uh, reports first reports concerning the said miracle occur far away geographically uh, from where the event's supposed to have taken place and number three if the events in question might have been allowed to pass without examination because they're confirmatory of beliefs already established. And so he points 
points out that it's a lot easier to uh, to uh, to confirm to, to 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 allow a miracle to pass without examination in a context where it's confirming beliefs already established and widely held in the cultural milieu than it is to establish a new set of beliefs and practices by virtue of a miracle. Um, and uh, the resurrection passes those criteria. That's not to say it happened, but it is to say that it's at least worthy of, of our time investigating. Now, um, it doesn't, it also doesn't necessarily, uh, if, 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 if we, if, if a miracle claim fails to pass those criteria, it also doesn't necessarily mean that the miracle didn't take place. Uh, it's just not, um, really uh, a good place to start investigating because the evidence for it is not likely to be very good. Uh, Tim McGrew fleshed out those criteria further um, and he uh, he summarizes them with the acronym DOUBTS. Um, so if I can remember them. Um, so DOUBT, uh, D stands for um, distance, O stands for um, confirmatory of opinions already established, uh, U stands for um, um, sorry, remember, um, uh, okay, so um, B stands for belated reports, T stands for trivial miracles, and S stands for um, self-serving self miracles. And um, I'm blanking what U stands for. Um, but anyway, these, these are the criteria that, um, that I would employ um, across the board. And I think these are religiously um, neutral. Uncertain events, that's the word I was looking for. Uncertain events is what U stands for. And uh, un, uh, meaning, so for example, um, Sai Baba uh, materializing a watch, it's something that one could plausibly be honestly mistaken about. All right, we're going to continue moving along. We've had a series of super chats that were sent in, so we'll get through as many as we can. Barely Protestant says he's just joining. I just came in, so if this was covered, I apologize. Paul, how can you quantify probability of miracles if God exists, especially without considering why said miracles would occur? Well, of course, I don't grant that God exists, so you'd have to get me that far. But let's say God did exist, even in a world where God exists. I think Jonathan and a lot of Christians around would, would agree that there are far more, and he won't agree with my quantification, there are far more miracle claims where people are attributing something to be a miracle than are actually God working. Now, if God exists, he's probably doing miracles we don't even know about, but that's fine. Just always on the table is lying and mistaken, meaning you might be attributing something to be a miracle when it isn't really. So again, this is why People like me are always looking for, well, why doesn't God heal amputees? Well, it'd be sure great to see something that can't be attributed to something else or is much harder to attribute to something else. Um, again, it's just for me, even though, even if God exists and even if the person is well-meaning, that they are falsely attributing something is more likely. All right, we'll, we'll just continue going because as, as I say, we have a, yep. a lot of questions that were sent in, so... Uh, from Snug and Sessor, looks like was belief in a physical resurrection required for the development of Christianity. I mean, that was the debate Jonathan? topic, and <laughs> well, um, we we can find out if we change each other's mind at this point. Um, <laughs> well, well, I, I think that I think that what correct me if I'm wrong. What came out of this is that you didn't deny that my hypothesis had explanatory power for the data you feel like your hypothesis is the superior one, not that mine can't or is, is irrational or implausible. Is that accurate? Um, well, I would say that it is irrational given the, uh, given a, an, a, um, being fully informed and full awareness of the data. Um, obviously, if I think a tr conclusion is true, um, then I, I have to think that it's irrational not to affirm it if you have a full knowledge of the evidence. Um, and, but, um, but yeah, I, I would say it depends what you mean by, by required. I mean, obviously, I don't think that it's um, absolutely certain that Jesus rose from the dead, but I do think it's the best explanation of the pertinent evidence. And I think it's a far superior hypothesis to the one that Apologia is putting forward. And it's not, in fact, the only evidence for Christianity. There's also other categories of evidence that I alluded to um, not long ago. I'm, I'm taking that as it's not required. Well, I, I would I would also argue that uh, the data can be made consistent with young earth creationism or a lot of hypotheses that I believe are false. If you are prepared to invoke enough auxiliary hypotheses to make the data right. fit. But that's an assertion. Like, I think you're doing the exact same thing. I think you are absolutely conforming data in an ad hoc manner to fit the conclusion that you've already come to. 
Like that's, and you've expressed that opinion of me. I absolutely express that same opinion. I feel like a lot of the, what's going on here is molding a hypothesis to fit data. So, I mean, that's, that's the, those are opinions. Those aren't facts, but that's, you know, those are the, those, we have yeah, the same. Obviously we're going to disagree. Where this is going. Well, let, yeah, let's, let's move on. Uh, we, cool. we do have more questions from Eddie Dean. Jonathan, how can you give little coincidences more weight than major contradictions in the gospels? So I, I do think that there is um, an epistemic asymmetry here. And what I mean by that is that historical points of confirmation of our minor details are significantly more evidence for reliability than the discrepancies are in disconfirming reliability. And the reason for that is because there are far more ways that one can be honestly mistaken about um, a particular fact or that one uh, that, that we might be just simply missing uh, a piece of information that, that harmonizes uh, the, the accounts. There are far more ways in which that could be the case than there are ways in which the historical confirmations uh, could exist on the hypothesis of uh, historical fictionalization. And so uh, I think that there's uh, there's an epistemic asymmetry here. And then also the discrepancies, I think, are positively relevant in some sense to the gospel reliability because they confirm um, uh, independence. And in particular, in those cases where upon learning some new piece of information or um, or inspecting the text a bit more carefully, they fit together quite nicely after. Just one very quick example. Um, so in the Synoptic Gospels, you have various women that discover the tomb empty on Easter morning, uh, and the identity of those women varies um, between the Synoptics, and it's not particularly concerning because Luke 24 specifically tells us that, that he's not giving us an exhaustive list, the other women with them, he says. But if you look at John chapter 20, verse 1, it looks like just Mary Magdalene that discovers the tomb empty. And so which is it? Bar Ehrman makes this point, and she's interrupted, for example. And um, you can actually press the argument for the objection further, because in Matthew, uh, the women actually just have an encounter with the risen Jesus uh, after their discovery of the empty tomb. Whereas according to John, Mary comes back to Peter and, and the beloved disciple to tell them she doesn't know what's happened to the body of Jesus. And so how do you harmonize those accounts? And uh, I, I think that the key is in John 20, verse 2, because you would predict on the hypothesis of historicity that uh, Mary Magdalene must have left this larger group of women before their encounter with the risen Jesus. In John 20 verse 2, it says that she ran to Peter and the beloved disciple, and she said, they've taken my Lord from the tomb, and we do not know, the verb is in the plural, udamen in Greek, we do not know where they have laid him. And so that use of the plural verb suggests that there was in fact a larger group of women that she had left and john's uh, inclusion of that statement shows that he is in fact aware of that and so the accounts fit together in a very natural and believable way that actually i think supports rather than detracts from the historicity of the account i call that reconcilable variation that points to uh, independence is is the very harmonization that we're essentially forced to is suggested in fact by a close reading of the text itself I just so want to I'm, say that I'm epistemic Paul. asymmetry. I just want to say that epistemic asymmetry is exactly why I reject miracle claims in general, because there's so many more ways to be wrong about it than to be right about it. Yeah, I was going to say that there's there's probably opportunities for both of you guys to want to respond to everything no, that's, that said. Yeah, it's just we've got a lot of questions that came in. So, uh, Richie Torres says, and this one's for Paul. Paul, your atheism undermines the ability to debate. Any oh, thoughts on that? Is this is this a Frank Turek type? Uh, I'm not. A, I'm just a brain, a fizzing brain moist, type of moist a, robot type of a thing. If so, well, that's very clever, I guess. But uh, I have, I uh, maybe maybe I'm maybe so. If you're presuppositionalist that way, I think rationality is a property of the universe, not uh, something that God granted us. I, I would actually agree with Paul on this point. I do think that's a good objection. All right, moving on from armpit Sarkar. Uh, John, how does one arrive at miracle as the best explanation for the resurrection than, say, a seemingly ridiculous yet natural explanation such as alien tech? John, that one was for you. Oh, sorry. How um, how how, um, how does how I does arrive one at I'll, re I'll just yeah let me yeah. let me read it one more time, John. How does one arrive at miracle as the best explanation for the resurrection than say a seemingly ridiculous yet natural explanation such as alien technology? Yeah, so you would uh, this would be an issue of prior probability or intrinsic plausibility. I mean, I, I think it's very unlikely that there are extraterrestrial uh, 
aliens uh, elsewhere in the universe. Uh, and uh, I think the number of life permitting planets is quite small. Uh, and even given a life permitting planet, that's a necessary, not a sufficient condition. And I think that uh, certainly naturalistically, it's highly unlikely that life emerged another time in the universe elsewhere. Even supposing that it did, I think that it, uh, it's enormously unlikely that it's ever made contact with the Earth or ever will make contact with the Earth, given the vastness of space. I mean, just from the sun to the Earth to the sun, you're talking you know, 93 million miles. And then to the next nearest star, Alpha Centauri, you're talking like 26 trillion miles. And there's about 200 billion uh, stars in our galaxy and about 200 billion galaxies in our universe. And uh, so just, just given the vastness of space, it's highly unlikely any extraterrestrial civilization has made or will make contact with the earth. And why would they even have motivation for raising Jesus from the dead? Uh, and so given, I, I think that there is a, a differential in terms of the prior probability, the prior probability of God raising Jesus from the dead, given the religious historical context, uh, is far superior and or higher than the prior probability that aliens uh, raise Jesus from the dead. It, it also no. would violate the second law of dynamics to physically raise someone from the dead as well. We've got that problem. I was going to say, I think uh, President Biden is is giving a, a he, well, he's talking about the things that were that were shot down, the uh, the three or four different objects that were shot down across the U.S. But Paul, do you live in Canada? I do live in Canada. We shot one across. We we shot one down too. Yeah, yeah, it was like right on the border, I think, or something like that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so he he's supposedly going to address like the whole alien thing today. But we'll awesome. we'll see what he has to say. Uh, all right, uh, Polycarp says, Paul, why didn't any of the other messiahs in the first and second century uh, that had followers, I guess, have hallucinations and things that led them to believe their leader was alive? Surely they loved their messiah too and were sad that he died. Well, that's an argument from silence because we have no idea if other religions did or didn't do that. We What we have is the extant evidence is from Christianity, which was the religion that won, the religion that became the part of the, emp the empire, the Roman Empire, and the documents that were going to be, in order for a document to survive, it doesn't just need to survive, it actually needs to be adequately copied. And of course, these other religions that didn't survive um, aren't going to be copied. I'm not going to go out and say that there were, that would be, that would be an argument for silence. But for, as far as I know, there were. And of course, you can look at various scholars who point to other sects who had rising and dying messiahs. And there are scholars who put this forth. So um, maybe it was happening. Do you guys, uh, we're, we're about at the two hour mark. Do you have time for more questions or do we need to go ahead and close it out? We can go a little bit longer if Paul wants to, but yeah, a little bit, not, not forever, but a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. We have four questions. We'll see if we can get through them All right. quickly. All right. From big feet. A uh, standard of evidence should be way higher to treat a human as an actual God on earth. Otherwise you're also Muslim Buddhist and Sikh with that evidence. God should have resurrected right on the cross. I guess. <laughs> well, I, John. I guess that's for me. Um, I, I think that the evidence for Christianity is far superior to the evidence for Islam and Buddhism. I suspect Paul might agree with me, but I, I don't know. Um, um, I mean, the, the evidence uh, against Islam seems to me to be overwhelming, and Islam is a subject I've done quite a bit of study on. Um, there's really almost no evidence at all for Islam. In fact, there's no miracle in the Quran that Muhammad purportedly performed that we could use to help us to evaluate whether Islam is true. And all the arguments the Muslims make, like scientific miracles in the Quran and so forth, are, are terrible uh, upon any uh, moderate or even trivial level of inspection. So, um, yeah, but I, I would agree in principle that uh, given the the stakes involved uh, and given how much this Christianity requires of us, um, and given that we're talking about a, um, a, a abnormal type of claim like the resurrection and so forth. I think that you do require some uh, more evidence than you would require for um, for many other things. Uh, but I think that the, I don't think it's, I don't think the prior probability of the resurrection is astronomically small at all. Uh, and I actually think that uh, it's at the, the initially low prior of the resurrection, and as I said, I do think it's incredibly small, is I think more than adequately overcome by the positive evidence in this case. All right, uh, moving on, question from Nitty. Jonathan, seems to me that there's plenty of time 
for fabrication and redaction to take place between the Gospels, not undesigned coincidences or a resurrection. How is this dismissed in your view? Uh, by virtue of the evidence that I've alluded to and, and much more, uh, if you want further information on um, on this, you can go to my website, jonathanmcclatchy.com. I have a lot of essays uh, where I unpack this in a lot more detail than what I was able to get into. If, if anyone in the chat wants to have a private conversation, then you can also reach out to me at talkaboutdoubts.com. And uh, this is basically a ministry for min uh, mentoring Christians with doubts. We also talk to ex-Christians and, and doubt uh, skeptics as well. So please feel free to reach out and I'd love to have a private conversation if you want to go into more details on this. Okay, question from Exploring Reality. He's got a YouTube channel as well. It says, uh, this one's kind of technical. McGlatchy's argument seems to be that the probability of R given E and K is greater than the probability of not R. R, I suppose, here represents resurrection. Uh, given E and K, it's not that the probability of R given E and K equals 1. With that, I need help understanding why it's a big deal that the data doesn't necessarily entail that the resurrection is true. Basically, he's asking, uh, so the evidence uh, is rendered more probable uh, by the uh, by the hypothesis that Jesus was raised from the dead, quite significantly more probable. And what, why is it such a big deal that the resurrection is not logically entailed or necessitated by, by the evidence? Paul, any thoughts? No. Uh, I, again, I... I... I, I put it forth in my opening statement. What I wanted to achieve today was to have everyone at least entertain the notion that resurrection wasn't a requirement, that there are explanations that can fit the data that uh, that don't involve a resurrection. Jonathan seems to have gone gone along with that, at least to a certain extent. Uh, in the same, he, we both feel like the other person is a young earth creationist in this scenario, and that's fine. Uh, anyway, I, yeah, again, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. I don't think that the resurrection is required, even if it is a clean answer. All right, question from Polycarp again. He says, question, if Peter was still connected with the 12 and they didn't experience anything, but he did, wouldn't they try to convince him he's wrong? They did live together for three years. Is this like this is probably for uh, me, yeah I think or, yeah I think it's for you. Uh, I don't. Ha this is I guess my point is that most of the disciples disappear from reliable history. Um, if if you call Acts reliable history, then they disappear after chapter four. I don't think Acts is reliable history, so I think they disappear at the time of the crucifixion. So I guess I just don't buy the idea. The premise of the question is that. Peter was still connected with 12, and I don't see evidence of that. He's still connected to John, uh, and that's it. And it seems like he's convinced John that he was right. And there's lots of, I have videos on psychological reasons why that might be true, but that's beyond the scope of this question. All right, let's do one more question. We had a couple more that were sent in. One of them from Odessa looks like we kind of just addressed it. So uh, unfortunately, we won't put that one on the screen. But Richard sent in a question for Paul. He says, Paul Agia, in a possible world where Jesus Christ rose from the dead, would the New Testament look different to ours? There's my puppy. I finally came <laughs> through. Um, would the, I, no, I think, yes, I, I think it absolutely could look different than ours. I, I, I think that uh, if I was if I was God, and you can never play that game because an infinite God knows way better than I do, that hinging my entire salvation on testimonial evidence, um, the worst possible kind of evidence that there can be for these kind of things, is a terrible plan of salvation. Um, and so, for me, if if God bothered to rise Jesus from the dead that he would have done so in a fashion that would allow me to at least accept that it happened so that I can make an actual choice about whether I want to have a relationship with him. As it is right now, I don't have an option to have a relationship with Jesus because I'm not convinced that he's alive. And it sure would be nice if I could at least have that informed choice. All right. I think that's going to do it for us. Let me let you guys, I mean, we, we didn't have like closing statements prepared or anything like that, but I'll give each of you maybe say 60 seconds, just kind of summarize your views uh, on the conversation and then we'll close it out. Let's start with uh, Jonathan. 
Sure. So just to summarize um, my, my argument in this debate, so I basically argued that the Gospels and Acts are composed by individuals who are close up to the facts, well-informed, and in the habit of being truthful. That being the case, then we've got this, we're presented with this trilemma argument um, that either they're, Jesus rose from the dead or they're honestly mistaken or the disciples lied about it. And we've seen that the Gospels, um, are, the, the set of claims that we have in the Gospels concerning the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters makes it quite unlikely that they were honestly mistaken. And the circumstances of the claims makes it quite unlikely that they were lying as well. And so I contend that the best or most probable explanation is that Jesus rose from the dead. And uh, if you want more details on this, I recommend going to check out my website, DuffinBadgie.com. There's also a great channel called Testify with Eric Manning that I recommend. And uh, in terms of literature, I recommend all of Lydia McGrew's books. Uh, her new one uh, called uh, Testimonies to the Truth, Why You Can Trust the Gospels is, in my judgment, the best publication at the popular level on this subject uh, currently. So I highly recommend going to check that out. Again, go over to talkaboutdoubts.com if you are a Christian struggling with doubts about faith and want someone to talk to, a scholar uh, who's an expert in the subject that you are uh, struggling with. Uh, also, we extend the same invitation to ex-Christians as well, and we'd love to see you over there. But I'll close out there and, and turn over to Paul. All right, yeah, Paul, so go ahead. So the history of Christianity does not require a resurrection. There are thousands of natural explanations that seem to fit the data. My personal favorite that I enjoy exploring is a single individual who was sincerely mistaken, started this whole thing off. And there's nothing presented today that eliminates that hypothesis or even under, undermines its explanatory power, unless you are want to give the Gospels and Acts a single place in history is the only document that all historians would say is either uniformly true or uniformly false that you have to take the supernatural parts at the same face value as other parts that may have coincidences that either impress you or don't they don't impress me uh, and i also don't see how being accurate in one portion of what they say says applies across the board so i hope that you would agree with me though that a resurrection is not a requirement and that we can then go about and decide which is the best uh, best option. And I think a naturalistic explanation is the best option. And I wanna thank Jonathan so much for having this cordial conversation. We haven't had a chance to have this conversation for a long time. We've crossed paths all over the place. I wanted to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I hope that this met with everyone's expectations and I hope that it can maybe even lead to more conversations on detailed things in the future. If not, Jonathan, it was a real pleasure. Likewise, thanks so much, Paul. Yeah, yeah, and thank uh, thank both of you for for coming on and and taking your time to, you know, organize your opening statements and present here and have this conversation. I really appreciate both of you coming on.